embêtant. Hein. En fait, ça devient... Ça, c'était vachement dangereux. Ouais. Et bah, le grand monde, parce que c'était... En fait, ça fait une tôle quasiment un peu à la fin de la pause avec des bases, quoi. Il y a combien de personnes Un peu là-haut. Je sais pas, c'est un peu là-haut. En haut. Mais en fait, c'est pas si petit que ça, déjà, les petits tôles. Ok. Uh, that was honestly by urgency, <laughs> but uh, it, and on the second look, it, it, I really love it like that. Yeah. Um, but like yesterday, I said uh, one of my first presentations, I noticed I could have used like four slides and just kept talking about the points instead of having a lot of slides. Yeah. And and the other coincidence is really that with the prior talk on this topic, I forgot the demo or I had a SSH disconnect and somebody told me I only had like five minutes left and it was 10 and so I just gave up. So uh, that those two things that are the starting point for this now. <laughs> <coughs> Um, we, we have like one minute left, but I would like to use that minute. Um, so I'm going to talk about how to deal with multiple operating systems. Uh, is there somebody in the room who runs Unix systems, but they only have one single operating system? Yes? Nice. Which one is it? Different versions of enterprise Okay, but different versions at least. Uh, that's good. Uh, which one, if you yeah. can say? Okay, but that's already two, yeah. by the name at least. Uh, I mean, it, it stays the same if you don't update. Yes, the CentOS. <laughs> okay, uh, who has more like 
five or something in their environment. Okay. Uh, you with the green hair, you, you looked like in pain for a second when you were thinking. Is there a lot of OS in your environment? Use some different versions of the same OS, probably. Yes. Okay, but only then. Yeah. Okay, good. And, and who has had to deal with some really old shit that nobody before them bothered to update? Okay, yeah, now we're, now we're talking. <laughs> okay, so um, I have tried to not cut, uh, cut corners in, a, in the demonstration now and in the presentation. Um, at some points I did, but I'm going to talk about them. Uh, like, like different OS, uh, let's say you, you have a Ubuntu setup going mostly 20, 22 or something, and then there's a single Ubuntu 14 system. I want to try to talk about how um, to express policies that still handle that and that stay maintainable. Because in the past, that was uh, stuff that was really driving me crazy. And I think we can start. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, I hope the Russell card is still there when we're done. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm glad that you came. Uh, I prepared a lot of demo for this today and less slides. Um, and I have to say that due to health issues in the last year, I couldn't over prepare like I normally do. So there is some things that I couldn't put in there, but I'm going to talk about them because I just didn't get around to basically implement it. But I, I don't have open questions on how to implement. So it's going to be OK, I think. Uh, yep. I think I have to press Enter. So uh, we're going to look at the tool stack for running tests and, and doing integrations, and also later about security tool stacks. <laughs> Uh, the, the main tool I used uh, is called Linus, which is a security scanner for basically all Unix-based operating systems. Uh, because it's a ro oops, it is a very interesting chair that suddenly goes down. Um, it is a very tricky topic to find tools that will handle a lot of operating systems and that stay maintained for some time, so that you actually able to. Uh, catch up and, and e uh, evaluate like how big are my problems with the old systems and bring them to a current state. Uh, Linus is really nice with that and it's easy to adapt. If you, for example, end up with a newer system that is not supported yet, then you can normally solve that and also the community is good. So you can send them patches. They're kind of a security consulting business, but still they, they interact with you if you uh, find something that is outdated. And it is very fast. And in the end, it delivers you a number, like a security score for the system. It is not a tool that we used to harden anything. It's just for checking if we did something useful or if we did it wrong. Um, then open Nebula as, well, basically the little private cloud to run the tests on. It could be any of that. It could also be some public cloud. It does not matter too much. What you want is something that is fast and where you can ma uh, run many tests in parallel. And then, well, on my end for the automation, I used Rudder. Uh, I also looked at the integration with Ansible for that a bit. I can talk about that later. Uh, but I think 99% of the things I'm talking about are independent of the tool that you use. It's more about the approach, how to like not dig your hole over a few years, but instead uh, stay at the same level with your cleanliness of the configuration policy. This tool is intended to go be good at that, but uh, it doesn't matter which tool I use as long as I care about naming conventions and stuff like that. OK, on the other side, if it's about actual security checks or well, protection maybe even of systems. The most basic thing is open ASCAP, uh, which gets you vendor supplied uh, XML files for scanning um, if a system is secure. What does secure mean in that case? 
There is multiple XML thingies that you can have. There is some that cover the actual hardening steps for a system and others that are just a list of outdated packages or packages with secur uh, security flaws. Because what you don't want is a tool that only tells you, I have a security update. You need something that tells you, I have a security issue, even before the update is out. And I found that Open ASCAP, um, usually the, the, the files for that are maintained well. But also, it is necessary to check every now and then if the vendor didn't have their tool chain broken or something. Because I've also seen that a few times. Uh, the worst part was downloading XML files from one vendor. And they were still valid, but they didn't have content. So the, the generation was just broken. And we had a good tool chain, and it didn't actually deploy them because we were a bit afraid of like downloading an XML file from the internet and <laughs> processing that on every system. Uh, so that's also interesting things. Um, the, the seemingly best approach is if you have one channel for getting the XML definitions and then another one, uh, another one for transferring your results back so that the two don't really meet on the way. And back then, I also did stuff like uh, before even processing the XML, I was scanning it to see if there is like uh, a C data field in there, like if there would be binary code in my XML, because I don't definitely know I don't need that. So we were excluding the obviously wrong things. But still, with almost every operating system that I touched, I had to get in touch with the community or the vendor to say, say, why don't is there a possibility to download that uh, over HTTPS? FreeBSD, for example, was a long, long thing, like over one and a half years, because they only by mistake had opened HTTPS on one of the servers. So that's the one where you could get it. But that wasn't the official one. It wasn't the proper one. And then it expired there. And you have a lot of these things. So you need to, you need to allocate the time for tracking that crap. It, it is really, there is never any complicated, hard problems with that. But if you don't save the time beforehand, then you're going to have like these random things, like over Christmas, our tool chain stopped working. So that's why you, you basically you need to always have a little eye on it. Um, another thing we're going to look at is AuditD. I mean, it's a really old tool. Mostly we notice it with, with SE Linux or something, or if anybody oops, had the luck to, to work in some super secure systems, maybe they also use it a lot. but. Uh, at least I, for many years, didn't have, I uh, didn't know like the main benefits of that. I'm gonna try to show them a bit. Uh, then about antivirus or malware scanning tools. There is a few more now in the recent years, but there was also a phase when there was a lot stuff that was back uh, was in security documentation and so on that was outdated. It was horribly outdated, like something that I knew from from the 90s. And they were still recommending to use that. Of course, that stuff doesn't find anything unless you find a hacker who has uh, still these old backdoors lying around. Um, then on the other hand, for more modern stuff, uh, there is IDS systems that just notice if something spooky is going on in a system. And there is also what they now call EDR, endpoint detection and response systems that try to actually be very annoying for an attacker. So not just like an antivirus system that deletes the file, but giving you the tool set to track an attacker on a system. These are very problematic if you have multiple OS. Like they support Linux and Windows, and if you're lucky, even a Mac. Uh, but it shouldn't be the Linux on your phone system, or it shouldn't be your Synology, or anything like that. Because then it's going to be like, oh, sorry, we don't support that yet. And if you read the news in the last weeks with, with VMware, ESXi, now they all notice that the stuff is getting hacked. And if you check the list of security vendors that actually have sat down and gotten a VMware certification for a plugin or anything, you, I don't know if there is any vendor that has it. So you don't, you're not going to find a lot. So that's something where we can also look, what can we do? And finally, uh, I want to go quickly over tools that are in the basic operating system. <coughs> there's, 
they not going to stop anything, but they can help you if you want to find out what happened to a system. And then my presentation breaks. And my SSH agent, agent breaks. OK, I love that. <coughs> One, two. OK, oh, that was the demo point. OK, all right. <laughs> um, that's fine. That's roughly the plan. <coughs> yeah, um, we will have some YAML. Uh, we will have Ginger. And we will ha have some XML. But the XML stays mostly in the open SCAP area. <coughs> um, has one of, or who of you have already worked with open SCAP? OK, OK, OK. Uh, who has seen an editor or reviewer for the files to actually debug them or check what their contents are? OK. Which one did you use? <coughs> if you still remember. <laughs> no. OK. So it was basically you try and then you throw it away. <laughs> or Uh -huh, uh -huh. OK. So I had tried two or three basic XML editors. I think one was called Escape or something. And there was one that took like five minutes to parse the file, and another, another one that was taking three seconds or so. But I also didn't go back to actually looking into the files. But if I would be doing it 24-7, then I would still have to do that. So that's also part of the tooling that you need to look at. And, and if you imagine that the files might be 30 megabytes of XML, then you need a lot of performance and RAM in your system. <coughs> OK. Um, I hope that is readable. Also in the back, is that OK? OK. Um, we're going to start here. So this is a little Open Nebula instance. And the first thing. I did this time, and I had to learn it the hard way before, was how to uh, was automating how I bring up test systems. So here, um, we have a simple idea called a service. And I have made one that is called like hardening guide or hardening for security. <coughs> if we look inside that, we find these pretty little boxes. One of, uh, uh, one of these always represents one operating system. I've set it to bring up two instances per operating system, because then I have a chance of debugging issues uh, and throwing away the first one and reapplying in the second one. Um, because if you if you try on on many OS or if you want to do regression testing, uh, then it gets very, let's say, tedious. If I would be doing this on Amazon, I would probably need some auto scaling stuff or something. Because if you manually have to act to bring up one more VM to run another test, um, you, use, uh, you use up too much time. So you al always want to have like, like a good cook, all the uh, things already prepared, and then you just use them. <coughs> um, so we, we have a normal Linux zoo and one FreeBSD box. I had a FreeBSD 12 also, but that is uh, kind of dated and gave me more trouble than I expected. So it had to go for today. And I've, I've uh, not generated these images with Packer like for the last time. So these are not clean images. This is stuff, well, let's say from the internet. And sometimes multiple updates because I want to have like a, a long failure chain. I want to actually provoke issues. It doesn't help me if it's easy. <coughs> um, yeah, that's about all. So now we're going to say we want to launch this. So. Let's go. Uh, I say one instance. That means that service is supposed to run once. It's, it's for web server stuff or something. You could run more instances. But we don't really need that now. <coughs> um, that's going to schedule these VMs. And here in cardinality, that means normally it should start two of them. And they have a slight bit of dependencies, uh, which I basically only did for the demo now. So normally, I launch all of them at once. And here, it's going to be like a little stack. So if Ubuntu 18 gets stuck, Ubuntu 20 is not going to run. <coughs> um, 
Um, yeah, and, and uh, I'm not sick. I was just partying a bit too much. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so here we start uh, CWM starting now. They, they get like a name that is matched up with some instance of that server. So 38 tries uh, to this day. So we sit here and can check. And I think it's going to bring up a few more, but that should be doing fine. <coughs> Each of these VMs has a so-called context script, which uh, makes basic settings like installing the rudder agent or setting up some package repository, stuff like that. I have an alternative thing uh, for if I hit cases where that is not the best thing. <coughs> So another thing you can do with these services is that you um, they have a name and you can actually, like with the Amazon metadata service, you can access that name. And so I have a little thing that is called curl to bash. And if I set up the service name right, I can fetch with that stuff from Git and just run that. So I have made two choices, both very mm. simple. So one is in Open Nebula and all the config happens there. If uh, that doesn't work for me, because, for example, there's some OS where that wouldn't match, then I can use this way. So that's, uh, let's say, the first lesson I want to pass on. If you build a solution for this, for um, doing a lot, of, a lot of testing of things that might not work, you're not going to be happy with just a CI solution. So you, you need to have a CI where you have like two points where you can plug into it or something. <coughs> because you will always have one OS or one thing that is not supported, one repository that's not updating anymore. And for that case, it's just good if you have a fallback. Uh, we should be running now. Yes. So the next thing these uh, little VMs do is when they start, they register with the rudder server. Uh, so we're going to head here. Currently, it only had two nodes, the master itself, and something called endgame, that is the Elastic EDR solution. Basically, that's the system where they send the reports to. If I do a refresh, we should slowly be getting a few more. <coughs> um, there is a little script that is set up to automatically accept a new node, which hopefully works. Or maybe I broke that because I was doing a lot of changes. Um, but I can click it also. <coughs> the point is normally they uh, automatically register. And once they register, there's like the basic policy that is predefined that's going to do security settings. But in this case, uh, it's only going to do the most light bit of settings, like uh, make sure that Oddity is installed, or make sure that this mi OK, now it, it has them. I have to wait a bit. Um, so the, the most basic things, like checking that the security tools are in place, but it doesn't automatically turn all of them on. Because I wanted something that um, matches multiple use cases, like if you're in a big corporation, you might have a banking system that is really critical for security. But you might also have a developer who says he cannot work like that. He needs more internet or something. <coughs> So the main idea is that you have a few levels of security that you can easily turn up. Uh, I didn't implement turning them back down, to be honest. Um, but you, you can say, OK, so this system should have security level 1. And then it's going to get some basic security stuff in place. It can have level 2. And then it's going to be tightened some more. And you could say you want to have a security level 3, which then runs the full, I don't know, Department of Defense. Uh, XML stuff for locking down the system properly. <coughs> um, let's see. Should be all now. Or actually, it's not going to be all because a lot of them are still applying updates at the moment. <coughs> but the basic thing is we see they registered with some OS. I'm going to zoom in a bit more. Um, we have here a super outdated OpenSUSE. Uh, we have uh, end of life CentOS. We have uh, most current CentOS, and we're going to have a few more that come in later. All of them are going to end up with some kind of policy, which is going to be this, the most light version. So if we look at that, 
we get an overview of, overview of the system. And if we look at that, it doesn't say security anywhere. So that means that's not so safe. <coughs> if we look inside, uh, we find some basic settings that are going to pave the way for applying uh, security tools. It's installing the key for Vasu if I want logging. Uh, and it's also going to do the most basic stuff like setting up ETC Keeper. So it's already turning the system into something that is maintained. But it's not a full policy, so I, I avoid like this conflict with the end user if they don't want that. They don't, they're not going to feel, uh, what's the word, restrained just because ETC Keeper is there. They're going to be happy because if they delete something, they can recover it. So uh, it's like a, a bit like a, a cat walking carefully in the, in the slowest level. <coughs> so if I would go and go to properties here, I mean, I can clicky click, I can use an API, it doesn't matter. Uh, and say sec level is one. Then the little, little machine up here is starting, and it's going to adjust that policy. And as I hope that's a good thing for the demo purpose, because we can just look at it on the screen, and, and I don't need to dig into any shell stuff or something. Um, <coughs> so now it's applying something called a baseline. So the pretty minimal stuff still, and the monitoring. So that means that system now has a basic level of protection. You would find out if something went wrong. <coughs> what do I get? Monitoring agent. Uh, the local host is being configured. Uh, it's going to install OSEC. And the OSEC gets base configuration so that it actually notices things. And then it also drops in uh, stuff like Open OpenSCAP to, to run security audits. With that, I'd say, OK, so we can track if something bad happens. Otherwise, we don't touch the thing. Now I'm going to pick another one, and we're going to set that one level higher. Uh, let's say I'm going to be risky. I'm going to try the old one. <coughs> And we're going to tell this one to go to level 2. OK. And that's going to pull in some, uh, some other configuration. I'm going to show in a moment where it comes from. Um, going to take a second. Maybe I have to reload the UI for that, because this is going to be cached at the moment. Let's see. And of course, I can always make typos. It's one of my specialties, but this looks good. So now it has a one more item, which is called restrictions. And this one I didn't prettify yet, so maybe we can try that later. Um, this one locks down file permissions in SUSE. Uh, it suddenly sets up timeouts so that you automatically get kicked out at some point. You get a proper U-mask. So if, uh, with my sysadmin mind, so this is not an idiot system anymore. This is actually a maintained system. But of course, it doesn't help if I'm happy as, this, as the administrator. It also has to work for the users. So that's why this stuff kicks in really late. <coughs> I mean, you could have security level 1.5. <laughs> um, there's hardening for the SysTTL suddenly, which is one thing that I would just always delay a bit. Uh, there is some that your security team is going to set up. But for the rest, I wouldn't just put out the most hard settings and then break stuff for people, and they have to debug why it's happening. Uh, zipper settings not so important now. Well, a lot of silly stuff. Uh, I, I had my 90s moment and set up a group that is able to run compilers, and other users are not able to run. Like, because if it's just a few clicks or uh, like one template file to edit, why shouldn't I do the basic stuff from 20 years ago? And this one, for example, this is for the cloud images. If you look at uh, Vagrant images from the Vagrant cloud, you should check if the systemd job that saves um, the RNG hash or seed was disabled and what the permissions on the file are. Because that runs on shutdown. So you're not going to see it at runtime. But on shutdown, it saves the random seed. And if you download some random image, uh, you might always have the same random, se random seed. And that's not so great. 
Uh, yeah, and that's, well, there's a lot more things like that, but I it's always the same scheme, basically. There is um, stuff for kernel modules and so on. Um, I'm going to show one little example of that on the CLI side. Uh, let's take one of the VMs. I oh, no, actually, it should be fine here. So it should be likely in here. No, it's not. Then here. Um, so we have the classic stuff like blacklisting certain kernel modules. Although I try to be a bit more, um, well, let's say fascist about it. And not just blacklist the thing that is in the security guides like flash file system but also to look for an, uh, kernel modules that do networking and do tunneling. So that I take away these channels where you could just hop from one system to the next one to the next one. Like a normal server doesn't need to be able to do NAT, for example. But if it can, it's helpful for other people. <laughs> um, kernel modules, yeah. So that, that, that was another thing, uh, basically, if you have let's say, a huge building with machines, and you sometimes still have visitors there, you should ask yourself things like, do I need USB ports? Do, I, do they need to be enabled? Do I need to be able to plug flash? So of course you say, I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn it off. Uh, but then you have this building, your office is there, and you just took away USB from everyone there. So maybe they need it. So uh, that's why we go to templates. And we, we have the most simple way of just setting that. We just turn it on or off. And if it's off, then we block this uh, language. <coughs> we blacklist the relevant kernel modules. Uh, because I don't want to try to do USB firewalling or uh, have some, 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 I don't know, what was the name from these little USB devices that you plug USB in? USB rubber ducky. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Something that is a keyboard and then it's not a keyboard or something uh, like that. Rubber ducky. Yeah, yeah. So I don't want that. Uh, there's better solutions for locking down USB, but not simpler. Hot clip. Hot clip? Hot glue. Oh, hot glue. Yeah, 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 exactly. But that's also like, that's the permanent thing. It's okay if you know. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you find somebody down there undoing the glue, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so what it does basically is it pulls, if it says properties here, it pulls the settings from here that I set up. It's, it's no magic there. It can also be inherited in some parts. And for my talk three years ago, I also played around, uh, played around with matching the names of these with the same, uh, with the variable names in Ansible. So I can have the same template in both things. <coughs> I have to say at the moment, if I would like to finish that completely, I need like a, a mountain hut and three months of relaxation to do the one hour of work. But uh, the example is already on, on GitHub. So anybody who wants to try something like that can. And, and there's also Felix's talk who always does this with Ansible and Puppet. It's not that hard. <laughs> And the main idea is your tool shouldn't matter for your naming conventions. Um, why? Not because you might switch your tool tomorrow, but because you want to have proper documentation. And if you have, like, like in, in Ansible, I can say list tasks. And also in Rudder, I can pull, pull lists of the things, of the settings that I did. And you need that. You, uh, you need to be able to track down what settings you had last year five years ago, because otherwise you end up in a huge pile of mess. Um, OK, jumping back to status reporting and where settings come from. So if you look carefully, you're going to see these little red unhappiness displays. Um, that's meaning the system is still working on it, because I just started everything. and I. For this demo, I did not change the interval. So this is running every five minutes. <coughs> so if it like takes two turns, it's going to be 10 minutes. There might also be an issue. 
which is cool because that's why I have to set up so I can actually look and see, okay, so that repository is not all right. I need to change it. Um, let's start here. Uh, or actually that one, that was the one that got the hardening policy. <coughs> I think, let's see, properties. Nope, that was the other OpenSUSE 42. <coughs> yeah, okay, so this is the security level two one. Let's see what it is unhappy about. Uh, okay. <coughs> yeah, so I, I was trying out step CA uh, to, to run my own ACME setup and uh, I'm not done with that. <laughs> uh, it, it basically, I think it already installed and it used also, I think, the right command for SUSE to, to update it, but that's uh, basically what's going on here. So this is a valid um, error message to me that I have to check and that my code and that uh, spot is not good enough yet. Um, we have the OSEC scanning. Yeah, so OSEC packages, I notify, like every operating system version does it different. Uh, if you're on CentOS, I think, on the most recent ones, there is Vasu and not OSEC, so you have to switch over. But that's a cool thing. Uh, Vasu is the commercial product, but it's exactly the same. So you, you can blindly install Vasu everywhere and you get a well-supported um, IDS, uh, yeah, let's say intrusion detection part uh, without any effort. You don't have to compile your shit or something like that, like it used to be a few years ago. And yeah, that's an SSH key being deployed, so it's just not finished yet. Uh, if I have to debug anything, I could use the logs here, but honestly, at that point, if I see some issues, I go to the system, I try to fix, I see if that, uh, if I can do that fix in the config management, so it's going to be robust, or if it's something silly, then I might be doing it uh, on the Open Nebula side, maybe, and do it with the next launch. But that's also, again, like, I have two ways to go into there and, and fix or work around things. Uh, yeah, now I have to check my list. Which is here. Um, mm -hmm. So for the EDR thing and antivirus and oddity. Okay, yeah, I get it. Oddity matters a lot because Oddity is so old that it exists almost everywhere. And on the other hand, it's still rare enough that if you're not dealing with, uh, let's say, state attackers, then they're not gonna take care of hiding their logs there. <coughs> I mean, it's not, it's not a commercial Unix, so there's not a, like a lockdown trusted computing base that would protect these audit logs. But still, uh, if somebody loads a kernel module, where would you find it? Or if he attempts to? Always an audit D. If as a Linux policy protects you, nice, but it, uh, the basic thing is in audit D you're going to see what they tried, what they did, and uh, a lot of tools are going to be able to process it. So for example, Wazoo thingy can, Splunk can, Elastic, well not Endgame, the, the uh, EDR solution, but Elastic itself has audit D parsing. So that's, uh, if, you, if you would only secure one thing, it would be turning on audit D. And it's so, so widespread. You can have Audit D on every Linux, obviously. <coughs> you can have it on FreeBSD. You can have it on Alpine Linux. So all the little systems where you normally end up with problems because your security stack is not available, Audit D is going to be there. And the other nice thing is the configs are pretty portable. So this config, uh, I, I think I, I ran on 10 or 15 for uh, different uh, operating systems. That's a base config to say the system should not crash if the disk gets full and Audit D cannot log. Because there are systems where you want that, but normally not. <coughs> and on the same end, you can easily plug in OS-dependent stuff. You can merge things. So. Uh, 
and you, you find well-documented rule sets. I mean, uh, what I've done here is that normally, if I look through the, through the security guides, I'm also going to write my notes. So you won't find a line where I couldn't track back why did I put that in there. Otherwise, you're also going to lose, especially if you want to compare between operating systems. So maybe that line here, I don't know, is not very applicable on FreeBSD. Maybe there's another one that, that I would need. But if I don't make my documentation here, I'm not going to find it. Uh, and then, yeah, be paranoid with that. So if somebody, for example, runs KX on your system, you should know. Like, if you get a different kernel, it's nice from them, but maybe you didn't like it. And the, the few use cases where you do that, you can filter it. If you have time to make it work with systemd, and then it works. Um, yeah, and, and so it's ba uh, the, the whole policy here is also <coughs> not uh, like not the military use case. It looks at obvious abuse. So my, 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 my main mindset is always like, if that happens and somebody asks me why didn't you spot that, it's so fucking trivial. That should be in there. Anything else is not a base policy, is not where you start. But these things where you're like, oh shit, that should be in here. Uh, I have to check the clock. I think we're almost done. Uh, 16.32. No. Oh, we're done now? No, it's 16.32. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 45 is the end. I was just uh, going to make sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but that's about oddity. And I'm also going to have these rules online, but I want to repeat, it's not that hard. You, you get them from the DoD and from a lot of different sources, and you can easily merge them. It's not a problem. So you, you can have them anywhere. Uh, so for malware scanning, uh, like I said, there has been a few more tools appearing in the last time. Um, there is Maldet, and there is, uh, from, from Florian Roth, something called Tor. Uh, it's a, like a free version of their uh, Tor Lite, yeah. They have a commercial product, which is for threat hunting teams or something, and they have a simple scanner. And the uh, most common denominator this time is Clem AV, or Clem AV which can run signatures from Maldet and Yara rules uh, from any security source. So you should have Clem AV installed. That doesn't mean you need to use it as an antivirus, but you should have it there for scanning your system if something goes weird. <coughs> um, then Elastic Endgame, I'm not going to show a lot now. The main point is there is a Docker container that you can use for testing purposes that you can download. You need like two minutes to start it and then 20 minutes maybe for making your policy. I'm going to show that. <coughs> uh, so this is Elastic uh, Security, I think is the name now. It was a different product called Endgame before they bought it. <coughs> and the basic parts are for free, which means uh, it's basically my modern antivirus for my laptop plus more. <coughs> there is a commercial edition which has machine learning and stuff like that. But uh, it is not CrowdStrike. So their input volume is like, I'd say, <laughs> I don't know, the one ten thousandth of something of, of CrowdStrike. They have 600 rules and I use Simbra for my email and I had to adjust the rules for running, uh, for, for working with uh, email software with 10,000 of installs. Uh, they're not done with the base policy yet. But on the other hand, if we go back to this point of, well, did I skip anything that would have been really silly, trivial, trivial to do? Okay, install it. <coughs> it's it's going to block the most stupid thing. And, uh, and you get the nice clicky-clicky features of modern tools. Like, I don't know. Let's see if I have some alerts. I hope so. Yeah, OK. Oh, no, that's events. Wrong, wrong point. 
Now, uh, we're unlucky, so I don't have a recent alert for some reason. Normally, it always has a false alarm. Maybe I fixed them. Um, basically, you get this tracing view where you can track a process, what it did, and, and which files it wrote, and, and search for stuff like that. Well, it's a big plus. Um, and if you want to integrate it in a testing chain, you can use the Docker container. Otherwise, you have to manually set it up because the Docker thing is not so maintainable. Like, it, it's going to fill up your disk. You cannot use, like, a proper staging with that. And that's a bit of a downside. But basically, a very good tool you get for free. The other thing that limits them is that they don't exchange the data. So where a CrowdStrike tracks all attacks and all users on the world that they have as clients, well, Elastic, you, you start it and you download the rules. <laughs> There's no exchange of any kind in that. OK. Um, yeah, so validation and permissions, very quick. Um, if you have any suspicious stuff, <coughs> that has gone on, you're going to figure out, OK, I can use RPM or Debsums to validate our files on the system. Or on FreeBSD, uh, FreeBSD update IDS. The thing is, you shouldn't start doing that when something happened, because you're going to have to do some uh, list editing. You're going to have to know like your normal exceptions that are always there. <coughs> Otherwise, you're going to have trash for data. So that's like. Per operating system, if you do that, you need like five minutes on a base install to, to manually scan, OK, this is bad, this is good, and to build your baseline. So if you deploy a new OS, that's something you should do. And of course, if you run hardening, <coughs> there's going to be a lot of config files with changed hashes afterwards. So that's another reason why you should <laughs> check those first. And for the permissions, uh, I've not found good solutions for Red Hat. SUSE is absolutely awesome in that part. And I don't use SUSE. Honestly, I don't. But that is awesome. You have like one config file where you can set up the file permissions for every file that gets installed via RPM. It doesn't matter which package it comes from or anything like that. And you drop that file. You say, I think, check stat or something. And it applies all the security settings. And that means you, you can have a pre-tested, uh, file system layout with all the files or important files locked down as you want them. And it takes, I don't know, two seconds. So it's a bit faster than SE Linux. <coughs> uh, I think, yeah, that's it from my side. Um, I, I would stop. And, and if somebody wants to ask something, I'm very happy to answer. Yes? Not so much a question as a remark. That yeah. If you, um, if you have a centrally managed infrastructure uh, in terms of attack, uh, transpa attacker transparency and things like that, I can only recommend uh, GRR. Mm -hmm. It's a great tool, but you install a, an agent that can do fucking anything mm -hmm. on the system, so you have to really nailed down yeah, 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 that's the server. Yeah. So, so <laughs> you open a door, uh -huh. which you, you must be certain that only you can yeah. open, but GRR is a great tool for, for forensics mm -hmm. uh, after the fact or to determine if something happened. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I can only recommend that. But again, yeah. here be dragons. So. Yeah, these remote channels are uh, sometimes a bit scary. <coughs> or actually, they're scary the whole time. The only difference is uh, that is a remote channel where you normally have a known good user, yeah. while the other thing is always a bad one. But yeah, yeah um, if you can watch Alexi's talk from yesterday, yeah. because they lock down what the agent of Rudder can do. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I can still nitpick things and say, yeah, yeah, but you, you could, like, I don't know, generate a SE Linux policy that only whitelists or allows the things that you have in the policy. OK, I, I can do everything if I have unlimited time. But still, uh, it's the same with config management. That's why I'm saying it. So it is not just security tools. Uh, there is nothing better for pivoting than the Git repository with the GitOps stuff or anything like that. That's our reality, and, and we have to do what we can. 
Anything else? Anyone else? Okay. Then thank you for your time. Uh, enjoy the rest of the config management camp.